Lesson six looks at the origins of the Nazi party, Hitler's early years, and eventually the Munich Beer Hall Putsch of 1923. This is the first lesson in the second part of the course. As I had mentioned, the course is really divided up into three um, or four parts. The first part is the Weimar Republic, its problems and its achievements. The second part is why did the Republic fail and why did the Nazis come to power? The third part is the Nazis in power and the fourth part, of course, is the Second World War and the fall of the Third Reich. So this is the first lesson in the second part of the course and it looks at the early years. So let's recap um, where we're at. We know that Stresemann succeeded in stabilizing Germany following the crises of the early years, 1919 to 1923. There were still some, there were still, despite all of this, of course, some several, um, several problems, including the fact that extremist groups had not disappeared, um, the economy was based on fragile loans, um, that foreign policy and any sort of attempt to work within the boundaries of the Treaty of Versailles fed into the aforementioned extremist groups, uh, amongst other things. Um, there were no revolutions from 1923 onward, but the groups that were um, organizing themselves and the extremist groups like the Nazi party, for instance, were busy regrouping, organizing, and waiting for a chance to challenge for power, something they couldn't do as long as the Weimar Republic remained relatively stable. One of these groups was the Nazi party. Um, and we needed to focus then on how to turn, uh, or how the Nazi party rather, turned themselves from a fringe party, a party on the outside of German politics, to the most popular party in Germany by 1933. We start then, of course, with Adolf Hitler. Um, Adolf Hitler was born in 1889 in Austria. Um, his father was a customs official on the Austrian-German border in the north, uh, northern part of Austria. Um, he grew up very close to his mother, but disliked his father. In fact, one might say he worshipped his mother. However, both his mother and his father died before he was 18 years old. And there's little evidence, actually, when you look at his early years, what little we know about it, in fact, that Hitler was destined to become anything exceptional. In fact, he showed no outstanding talent, no particular ability. He was marginal in just about everything he did up until the First World War. Um, he was a failure at school. He was often at admonished for his terrible grades, his attitude, his lackluster uh, work ethic, amongst other things. Um, in, at the age of 18, he moves to Vienna with the dream of pursuing art. He becomes a street artist in Vienna, applies to the Vienna Art School, and is turned down on several occasions, and basically becomes a failed artist, selling his sort of marginal or sort of drawings of Vienna, uh, most of which are marginal quality to tourists who happen to be going by. Um, Hitler during this time was extremely poor. He lived in hostels, uh, workhouses, anywhere where he could get a bed for almost next to nothing, and uh, really was on the margins of society. It was during his time in Vienna, though, uh, that a lot of his formative ideology was, was sort of laid down. Not that he was doing so in any sort of great quest that he, or in, he even not that he was showing any indication whatsoever that he had dreams of or potential to be the leader of Germany or Austria, for that matter. But mostly what we see here is the formation of his broad political beliefs. Now, what we have to understand about Vienna is Hitler was raised in a Vienna that was profoundly anti-Semitic, profoundly nationalist. He would have been uh, influenced by the notions of uniting all of the Germanies and this concept of pan-Germanism, making sure that all Germans are united in some sort of greater German Reich. These are things that will become foundational. In fact, that's the, literally the first line of Mein Kampf. Um, the, these things we know Hitler had formed, or at least um, concepts that he had developed early on when he was in Vienna. And they would be very foundational in the shaping of the Nazi party. None of which would have come to the fore had it not been for the First World War. When war breaks out in 1914, Hitler had abandoned Vienna and his lack of success there and moved to the fatherland, Germany, landing himself in 1913 in Munich, Bavaria, with a little bit of money in his pocket because he was able to secure um, a little bit of inheritance from his father's estate, which came due to him at the, on his 21st birthday. And in 1914, he finds himself in Munich, again, not with any particular purpose, but at the time the war breaks out. Uh, in 1914, he enthusiastically joins the German army. He's 
pictured uh, in the crowds announcing the outbreak of war in Munich in a very famous picture waving his hat. Um, and he joins the German army. Um, in the German army, he was an, an excellent soldier by all accounts. Uh, he was awarded the Iron Cross, Germany's Medal for Bravery. Um, and also during the war, it was noticed that Hitler was an exceptionally good speaker. The Allies would often fly planes over the German lines, dropping leaflets and propaganda saying, you know, your, your families are all dying, but, uh, your country, your, the Kaiser has run away, basically dropping propaganda, trying to break the will of the German forces in, in Europe. And Hitler was actually given the job, believe it or not, to counter Allied propaganda because he was such a good speaker, something that the military officials knew very early on. Um, and he, apart from being a war hero, uh, was also quite actively involved in sort of the German propaganda team. In 1918, he suffered a ter uh, terrible gas attack, uh, him and his unit did, and he was hospitalized, actually, very nearly killed by gas, um, and found himself at the hospital when the war was ended. So when the armistice was signed on November uh, 11th, 1918, Hitler was in uh, a German hospital recovering from a gas attack. He was also in that German hospital during the time of the Spartacus uprising, the quote-unquote German revolution. Unable to do anything while he recovered from his injuries, he sort of sit, sit back, watched, and sort of stewed with frustration that the, uh, the Germans uh, or what was happening to his beloved fatherland. After the war, he returns to Munich, tries to stay in the army, and of course gets recruited into one of these new Free Corps units. And his job in the Free Corps wasn't necessarily to kill communists. Uh, there's no evidence that Hitler took part in some of the brutal reprisals against communists that the Free Corps were known for. But what his job really was, was to sort of give evening classes and political education. Essentially, he becomes a tool of the Weimar Republic, very ironically. And he needs to educate German soldiers on the new political system in Germany, et cetera, et cetera. Additionally, he was told to go and check up on some of the serious extremist groups, and Bavaria was full of them. Um, and these groups were operating all around Munich. And it's in that time that he finds himself spying on and checking on, on, a, on, a, on a new party, a group called the German Workers' Party. Um, and he, his job was to sort of go in, learn about them, and to counter their propaganda by getting out an alternate message to the people. Now, when he goes to the German Workers' Party, Hitler is um, sort of unfavorable to them at first, but eventually becomes somewhat um, in agreement with a lot of their group's ideas. And they were led by a man named Anton Drexler. Drexler... Um, soon realizes Hitler um, as a man of great talent. Of course, I should mention before that, Hitler quits the Free Corps almost immediately once he sort of falls in line with the German Workers' Party. He's one of the first people who joins. Some people say that he was about 55th person to join the German Workers' Party when he first starts spying on them. They only have six members. But anyhow, nevertheless, he's one of the very first people to join. And Drexler soon realizes that this new recruit, if you will, is a man of some particular talents. In the 1920s, the party will announce a 25-point program under Hitler um, that will become the foundation of the Nazis' party beliefs. And Hitler is really given the job of spreading this 25-point program and spreading, spreading the ideas of the party in, in places where people listen to political speakers, most notably in, in Munich and in Bavaria at the time, in the very famous large beer halls, which were men would go and discuss things after work, men of all social classes, and people could stand up, be heard, and get their political points across. It was very much like, a, imagine if you took Speaker's Corner at the side of Hyde Park, put a lot more people listening to the people who talk at Speaker's Corner in a small beer hall uh, and there you go. That's sort of what he did. And Bavaria in itself is actually a really good place for such a party to start. It had a right-wing government at the time. Um, it was facing communist revolution, so there's lots the government could rail on. Um, many ordinary people in southern Germany were opposed to the Social Democrats, the SPD, which were leading the Weimar Republic. And it seemed that, you know, in many ways, this was a very fertile ground. So, you know, some historians have said his, Hitler, Hitler was really a product of circumstance. And in many ways, Hitler becomes nothing. He's anywhere else other than Bavaria at that particular time. Now, I've posted the German 25-point program. Not going to read it to you. You can read it yourself. This gives you an idea of their broad beliefs. And they're relatively consistent from this point on and forward. The appeal of Hitler was quite great. Um, Hitler 
uh, is so powerful as such a speaker, it's soon decided amongst the Nazi party members that he needs to become the leader. And Drexler is deposed, but in any great way, Hitler effectively is just given the position because he's so much more effective than Hitler, rather than Drexler in 1921. Hitler had the energy commitment, um, he was a powerful speaker, and he attracted a lot of attention. His clear, simple appeal stirred nationalist passions in his audience. Hitler wasn't saying anything new. Um, in fact, Hitler was just regurgitating a lot of the people's beliefs, but he was doing so in a very engaging way. He had very piercing blue eyes. He would stare at you. He, when people were waiting to hear him speak in these beer halls or um, in public gatherings, he would always arrive late to build a sense of anticipation. And then he would stand silently, sometimes for minutes before beginning speaking. And if you watch a Hitler rally, even when he's in power, he does, of course, all of the same things. He would start softly and then build, and then end up in this fear, furious finish, this crescendo of power and emotion, leaving himself absolutely physically drained when he was done his speeches, having worked through them in such a, such a ferocious way. But these were incredibly engaging, and they really gripped people. Not only that, he gave them things that they wanted to hear. He gave them scapegoats, okay, people they can blame their problems on. Of course, during the 1920s in the Weimar Republic, there were many problems. He could blame them on the Allies, particularly the French and the Treaty of Versailles. He could blame it on the November criminals, the communists and the Jews. Beyond just speaking, Hitler will be essential in reorganizing the party along military lines. In fact, Hitler becomes so successful, in fact, that many of his political opponents start to fear him, and they start to try and break up his meetings using sort of thug groups or paramilitary groups, and the communists, for instance, who try to break up a Hitler meeting by using what they called the Red Front Fighters, which was their sort of bodyguard slash paramilitary organizational unit. This is something relatively unique about German politics at the time. Um, it's really actually also a consequence of the First World War, this sort of sense of militaristic order and violence being added to the political spectrum. But Let's not get into that in too, too much detail. What you basically need to know is that Hitler decides then that in very early on that he's going to organize the Nazi party along the lines of the military. Having had lots of experience in the military in the First World War, he saw that as the best and most effective structure for the political party. So in 1921, he sets up his own private army. He calls them the SA. I'm not going to pronounce the German pronunciation of that or even attempt it. I'm just going to say that the SA loosely translates to the stormtroopers. These are made up of mostly young men. Most of these young men were former members of the Free Corps. They dressed in brown shirts and were known, therefore, as the brown shirts. So when you talk about the Nazi party, a lot of people just refer to them as the brown shirts. Interesting tidbit, interesting side fact. The reason they had brown shirts is the Nazi party didn't have a lot of money. And the German colonial soldiers, okay, back when German, uh, Germany had colonies before the First World War, wore desert brown uniforms. And of course, Germany had its colonies taken from the, the Treaty of Versailles. So in the army surplus stores and the sort of the government stores, there were all of these uniforms that the German army couldn't use anymore. Of course, the German army was minuscule and they had no colonies. So they sold them for the Nazis for a pittance and the Nazis then adopted the German colonial army uniforms, the brown ones that, of course, they had worn in the deserts of Africa when they were, in fact, a colonial power before the First World War. That's just really, I guess, a matter of coincidence, but anyhow, interestingly enough. Um, these guys protected Hitler's meetings, and in fact, they always, they actually go quite a bit beyond that, and they will stir up trouble themselves. Another thing Hitler will do is invent a logo for the Nazi party, and he invents the swastika. Um, he personally designed the Nazi flag. The swastika wasn't a new symbol. It was adopted from the actually Hindu culture. And he chose the swastika symbol and the colors, red, white, and black, because they were the colors of, the Germany's, of Germany's flag under the Kaiser. The swastika had actually been used as a, a logo of some nationalist groups before the First World War. And as such, uh, it was sort of a natural merger, merger of right-wing nationalist movements and a, an attachment to the dream of an imperial Germany, just like the one that had been under the Kaiser, which of course was destroyed in the First World War. It quickly became the best political symbol in Germany, and um, or best political symbol, best known political symbol in Germany. This all gives Hitler, let's just say, a false sense of self-confidence. The party is growing, his popularity is increasing, his paramilitary unit is 
uh, able to protect him and then turn away thugs and cause their own trouble at the time. And it leads him to believe that perhaps in 1923 it is the right time to move and overthrow the government and eventually take over the power of Germany and Bavaria himself. Um, he, there are three, or actually four reasons why um, he thought that it was time in Munich to have a putsch and overthrow of the government. The first one, okay, um, he was quite popular. Uh, the Nazis had 20,000 members, which was quite a, an increase in their membership from the early days where they only had six. So in about a short period of four, four, three, four years, the Nazis grew to 20,000 members. Not only that, in 1923, the German government was completely unaware of what was going on in Bavaria, and it had to be. It was completely and utterly preoccupied with the economic crisis of hyperinflation. And as such, he thought that the German government wouldn't put much of a fight if he, in fact, then tried to overthrow it. Um, what's more, uh, Stresemann had called off the... Uh, uh, the Ruhr issue, the passive resistance. You know that the Germans had uh, initiated a, a policy of passive resistance in the Ruhr. Uh, this effectively meant that um, they were not going to work with the, the forces of the Weimar, uh, sorry, of the occupying French. And when they, when they did that, the nationalists, the people on the German right who believed that you had to resist the French and the past of resistance had actually been one of the few things the Weimar Republic did right, were infuriated. They were like, there's no way you're going to work, work for French. And not only that, you're going to, you're going to then pay back the reparations. It was completely unconscionable. So the, the rural resistance being called off and sort of the the collapse of uh, the Germany's will to sort of abstain against the French in the midst of the economic crisis was seen as inconceivable. So he thought that it would be a really good time to rally people against the Weimar Republic. Additionally, additionally, um, what's actually an understated fact is that Hitler had the result, or rather the support of some very influential people in Germany. Um, he had, through, you know, not only the popularity of his speeches, et cetera, et cetera, made some very important and influential allies and friends, people who joined the Nazi party and gave it legitimacy. He was joined by General Ludendorff. You may recall from talking about the First World War that the Germany had been run in the First World War by two generals, one named um, uh, General Paul von Hindenburg, who we know about. Uh, of course, he becomes president in 1925, and some people blame as quite responsible for the fall of the Weimar Republic. Um, the other one was General Erich Ludendorff. And Ludendorff joins the Nazis very early on and gives Hitler a lot of support and will take place and work, I'm sorry, actually fight with him in the Union of Putsch. The other one is World War I flying ace, socialite, relatively famous person, um, Hermann Goering, who joins the Nazis very early on. Goering is able to connect Hitler to people of influence and give Hitler and Nazism the sort of respectability that they were lacking as just a friend of Beer Hall party in Bavaria up to this time. So what we see see here is that things are starting sort of in place. Hitler has a number of reasons to think that perhaps this is our time. So what happens? Um, 3,000 Nazi SA stormtroopers began taking over official buildings in Bavaria. The next day after the sort of uh, initial shock of the Beer Hall Putsch, the Weimar government forces hit back. The police will round up the stormtroopers. There'll be a brief exchange of gunfire. Uh, 16 Nazis will be killed, three policemen will be killed. The rebellion is broken up quite easily. And in the chaos, Hitler actually escapes in a car while Ludendorff and the other state have faced the armed police. And this is, um, uh, and this is really the, the heart of the collapse, the Beer Hall Putsch. Of course, when the, uh, many of the Nazis are killed, the rest of them just run away. Ludendorff's arrested. Hitler is eventually captured and arrested. And, and the Beer Hall Putsch is relatively easily defeated. There are lots of reasons for the failure of the Beer Hall Putsch. Um, the most important one, probably, is the fact that Hitler miscalculates the mood of the German people. He believes he's sort of speaking for them and that they're going to listen to him and do what he thinks. And effectively, this miscalculation um, 
leads to him being completely unsupported in the Birol Putsch. Not only that, the German army didn't support the Putsch either. He thought that with Ludendorff on his side, the army would be on his side, that he was the man who was speaking to the wants of the people in the army. And without the army who refused to support him, they don't support the government either, I should mention that. That's a really important point. They don't support either side of the army, just wash their hands and stay out of it. But without their support, the Nazis aren't strong enough to fight the armed police of the Weimar Republic. So in the short term, the Munich port Putsch is an absolute disaster for him. Uh, the people don't rise up and support him. Him and other le uh, leading Nazis are arrested and charged with treason. However, he's able to sort of make lemon, uh, lemonade out of lemons here, and he gains enormous publicity for his new ideas. And uh, through his trial, which every word of it, which is published in the paper, he becomes um, basically more of a household name than he was before in Germany at this particular point. So the trial of 1924, our last point for this lesson, is important. Hitler is so impressive in his trial and his defense that the judges and, um, uh, and let him and his accomplishment, uh, accomplices off very, very lightly. Ludendorff is let off altogether. Hitler is only given five years for being the mastermind of revolution when it should have carried a life sentence and very, at the very least probably led to his hanging. Of that life, sen or sort of life sentence, of that five-year sentence he receives, he only serves nine months. He serves that nine months in the relative comfort of Landsberg Castle, where he's allowed visitors to come and go, et cetera, et cetera. It's basically like a, a clubhouse for the Nazis when he's in prison. Other leading Nazis are given short sentences. Uh, Rom, who will lead, was the leader of the SA, will become one of Hitler's chief lieutenants through the early years and someone who Hitler actually has killed in 1934. Um, but nevertheless, he's given a 15-month sentence, but it's commuted and he literally serves absolutely no time. The light degree of their sentences is very significant. It shows that, you know, there is some sympathy for Hitler and his political ideas amongst the people in the uh, political system of Germany. Um, his links with Ludendorff also helped him gain the attention of important figures in the army. And actually, it's probably the reason the army stays out of the beer hall putsch altogether. Additionally, okay, um, though the years after the putsch were difficult, Hitler did emerge as a much stronger figure, a national figure. And of course, he'll use his time in Landsberg Prison, amongst other things, to go um, write his memoirs, his book Mein Kampf, which will sort of outline his political philosophy and become one of the great legacies of the Beer Hall Putsch. Nevertheless, what we'll see in the next lesson, he enters after the failure of the Beer Hall Putsch, the wilderness years. The Nazi parties ban Hitler's in jail. It looks like he's done. But Hitler will bounce back remarkably um, through both organization and setting up for the party for when the time is right. And not only that, of course, um, uh, seizing on the opportunity brought about by the Great Depression.